Good evening. Thanks for coming. I'm going to be talking to you about a new technology that you've already heard if you attended the research conference last year, as well as what if some of you were here for the post-research conference that I did as well. There was something related to this. And so I bored you two times already. Hopefully I don't get to do it this third time. And I'm going to focus this talk in terms of what I'm going to be doing for the next few years as I transition from a fellow to a junior faculty. And so it's called grin microendoscopy of the inner ear. And let's see something here. And it basically is, I'm going to describe to you what I intend to do for research wherever I end up as, as an attending. So this is your job talk? <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed already, so I'm going to be late for the job. All right. <laughs> So you're, you're getting the last of it. <laughs> so I have no disclosure. And I'm just going to say that I've gotten offers. So if you don't like to talk, it's you. <laughs> so this is going to be the outline of my talk. I'm going to give a small introduction of what my project is. I'm going to talk about the problems with the existing technology that we have now to image the inner ear. I am going to talk about the grin lens technology, which you already know if you attended the research conference. I'm going to show some preliminary, preliminary idea that we acquired. And then hopefully the bulk of my talk is going to be what I'm going to be doing for the next few years. So as everyone here knows, hearing loss is among the most common chronic sensory impairments of all human conditions. 4% okay? of people under 45 years of age and almost 40% of those 65 years or older have some sort of handicap hearing loss. If you add all that up, that represents 640 million people around the world that have hearing loss that interferes with social or job-related communication. In over 80% of these cases, the cause is degeneration of hair cells and their associated spiral ganglia neurons. And obviously, developing effective means of preventing this neurodegeneration and of treating it is a paramount challenge. This is a graph of the prevalence of hearing loss as we age. And obviously, as life expectancy increases, the burden of degenerative disease is growing. Sensory neural hearing loss is nearly epidemic in proportions. <laughs> now, to bring it home, kind of like into realistic, practical terms, patients that we see, patient with sudden sensory neural hearing loss after a cold. We see this patient in clinic and we say, oh, it must have been a virus. Patient with sudden sensory neural hearing loss with severe rheumatoid arthritis or Schurgen's or Coogan's. Oh, it must be autoimmune inner ear disease. Patient with sudden sensory neural hearing loss after heart surgery. You will hear, oh, it must have been the anesthetic, or oh, no, 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 it must have been an emboli from the heart surgery, right? That's, that's what we tell the patients. And obviously, the most important one is the patient who has sudden sensory neural hearing loss, idiopathic, we have absolutely nothing to associate it with. So associations, correlations, or just plain lack of knowledge in these patients. 21st century, and we cannot see the inside of the ear. 21st century, we cannot see the inner ear. It's amazing that of all the systems that we have in the body, we can't tell the patient what exactly is going on inside. That is my interest. And that's the main reason why I want to do inner ear imaging for the next few years. Now, the problem with the cochlea is that the cochlea is not easily accessible as brain, or as the eye, or as the olfactory mucosa. It's embedded deep within the temporal bone. Reaching the delicate inner ear structures, the membranous labyrinth requires cracking open the dense otic capsule with potential damage to, these, to the membranous labyrinth. So conventional methods that we have right now 
such as immunofluorescent that's coupled to confocal, that's coupled to single photon, coupled to two photon, and electrophysiology preparations, they require direct inner ear access. Basically with in vitro preparations, and most of the time with immature preparations before the otic capsule solidifies and ossifies, right? And usually you require, you take these out because you need an objective or you need your patch clamping to be less than one millimeter so you can actually have good resolution. This is just a routine immunohistochemistry of the spiral ganglion Rosenthal's canal going through the helenella perforata into the organ of Cordy that I stained a few years ago. And this is the typical thing that we get. We can get cellular localization, but we don't have anything like this where we can see it in an in vivo dynamic view. Thus, established methods to either study cochlear morphology or function, but not both. And we have resorted to testing the cochlea indirectly through otoacoustic emissions, outer hair cells, as well as auditory brainstem responses, testing the whole auditory pathway. So one of the major limitations to the present technology, the current technology, is that we have the, in is the inability to study inner ear cellular pathways and degeneration in vivo. Previous studies that have been done, and they're elegant studies, provide snapshots of the cellular degeneration at individual time points using different cohorts of animals. So we take that patient that has sudden sensory neural hearing loss with a cold, and we tell them, yeah, it must have been a virus, goodbye. Wouldn't it be cool to have a system that we can somehow take a look inside that inner ear? And that's why this is interesting to me that we have absolutely no idea what's going on in the cochlea of these patients, and hopefully we have a chance to figure it out. So this is where I introduce the GRIN technology. Microendoscopy using the GRIN lens is an emergent in vivo imaging modality, it's minimally invasive, that provides micron scale optical resolution in tissues inaccessible to classical light microscopy. It stands for gradient refractive index lenses, and this is a picture that I took, and you've seen this before. That's the green lens right here. That's beside a 20x objective, and this is another green lens that's beside a one penny. You can see this one's silver coated and this one's black. This one is just has a metallic sheet to protect it, to give it a little bit more sturdiness because they break easily, and this is just painted black. And this is kind of like a dramatic of a slice <laughs> of that green lens. Now, the way these lenses are made is that they're doped with cation species, two types usually, thallium and silver. And the way that they're made is that in light rays, the reflection occurs in a gradual manner as light passes through the lens, from the periphery to the central to the periphery. Now, as, as the light travels in the cylindrical lens, it kind of creates a sinusoidal pathway called a pitch. So if you have a full sinusoidal pathway, it's called one pitch. If you have half of it, it's called half a pitch or a quarter of a pitch. And so what you have here is the grin lens with the relay lens. And so this is kind of like the theory behind it, okay? So in conventional uh, lenses, you have light that kind of gets bent by the, the fraction of the lens into your target tissue. And then as the emission comes back, it's done in a similar way. What the grin lens does, fluorescent microendoscopy, is that as light travels, it hits the specimen, and then it travels in a sinusoidal pathway that then continues in the relay lens in the sinusoidal pathway coupled to an objective, which you will see later on. So the primary function of the relay is to provide sufficient length for insertion into deep tissue. Okay? So this is kind of like our, 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 uh, our drawing. This is where we would have our, our target, in this case, organ of Cordy. This would be the grin lens right here with the relay, and this would be our conventional objective. So the classical studies are putting the sample just right here, less than one millimeter, right? And that's a problem with the cochlea, because you don't have that space, right? And so we're inserting this one to reach our sample. They can be made in sub-millimeter sizes between 100, yeah, 100 microns to 1,000 microns. 
And obviously, as, as you make this lens longer, you start getting into what's called optical aberrations, okay? And thus, <coughs> optical aberrations decreases your numerical aperture, and thus it decreases your resolution, and thus you don't get good quality images. So it's best to choose a relay lens that is short as possible, but long enough to reach your target tissue. Okay, the numerical aperture can be as high as 0 0.5, and the website even says now that they can go down to 0 0.2. They can, they, they can attain a theoretical resolution of 1 to 2 microns with two photon microscopy. The working distance, depending on how you customize your lens, varies between 250 and 400 microns in water, which is very important because the coke is full of endolymph and perilymph, right? Now, a little bit of methodology, I'm not gonna go as much into detail as I went to the research talk, but I'm gonna use, I'm using the guinea pig, and the reason I'm using the guinea pig is that it has a relatively large cochlea, it has four and a half turns, it's easily accessible. We are creating a cochleostomy to insert this lens to look at inner ear structures, and we're doing it through a minimally invasive chemical uh, procedure, which I will show you. The cochleostomy is done at the basal turn of the cochlea at the level of the scale of tympani. In terms of frequency, it's between the 14 and 16,000 uh, hertz. To visualize the hair cells, I'm using AM143, which is a dye that I injected to the inner ear that gets tagged with hair cells, which lets them light up green. Okay, and I'm injecting this through the round window membrane. At the same time, I'm using systemic fluorescein through a catheter done through the femoral artery. And the plan there is that we want to look at the microcirculation, the vascular pattern at the lateral cochlear wall at the spiral ligament. These are the two lenses that we've got here. They're both quarter pitch. One of them is slightly bigger than the other. They both have the same numerical aperture. They have various different, differing uh, working distances and differing lengths. <clears throat> So a little bit in terms of the technique, this is the guinea pig. We shave off all the hair in the back. We do a post-auricular incision, and just immediately there, you find the bulla, the tympanic bulla. Bluntly, we create a hole inside the bulla, and then this bulla is expanded, and this is what you get. So this right here, this, this is kind of like the anterior soft tissue flap, posterior. So snout is over here. The front legs are over here and then the ear is up here. This right here is the bulla opening, <coughs> bless you. This right here is the round window niche with the round window membrane, and this is the basal turn of the cochlea. That white area that you see spiraling along, that's the osteospiral lamina, and at the distal part of it, that's where you have the basilar <coughs> membrane and the organ of cordy. This is a, a video uh, lasting a few seconds. We're applying this chemical here to do the chemical cochleostomy between 14 and 16 kilohertz area at the basal turn of the uh, cochlea. So at the end, this is what we're left. Again, the same round window niche. You can see now the cochleostomy. You can start to see the microvasculature of the membranous labyrinth at the scala tympani. This is a video showing a capillary that I've pulled that's at the distal tip is 12 microns, that's going through the round window and piercing the round window membrane. This capillary is then coupled to a pico spritzer where you're able to control very, very small quantities of the AM143 that I'm using right here. And so I inject one to two microliters into the, uh, through the round window into the scala tympani. So now, if we look at what we're dealing with, this is a histologic section of the guinea pig. It's paraffin, in, embedded in paraffin. You can see here the organ of cordy. That's the basilar membrane. This is the osteospiral lamina. That's the spiral ganglion, Rosenthal's canal, organ of cordy. <coughs> spiral ligament and the start of the stria vascularis. So if we look at the dimensions that we have to deal with, we're talking about 50 to 80 microns thickness that we have to rapidly decalcify to get our, our lens in. The width that we have is pretty big because our, we can have microendoscopes as small as 200 microns, but we have between 800 and 1200 microns 
and from the wall to the target organ of cornea in this case, but we could target the spiral ganglion or we can the, the peripheral processes, but it's 500 microns. So the whole point of it is that we can get a grin lens in to actually image the organ of cornea. In a similar fashion, with the microcirculation at, at the lateral cochlear wall, here we have another section of the spiral ligament, the stria vascularis. This is Reisner's membrane, organ of Gordy. So if we were to decalcify this area and we were to put a Grin lens in, then we could image this area over here and assess for blood flow at the lateral cochlear wall. This is the methodology that we use in the rig. Again, we have our sample. This is the Grin lens. We have a titanium sapphire laser that has deflectors that goes through the scan and tube lens. It goes through the conventional objective. It goes through the relay lens to the Grin lens to our sample. The tissue is excited with emission coming back through the dichroic mirrors. It's deflected to our photomultipliers and then processed through our computer. This is a slide showing the rig that we're using. What we have here is basically a motorized stage with a 3D stereotactic head holder. This is a guinea pig that's mounted on the rig. These are our conventional objectives right here. We have a CCD camera. We have the photomultipliers right here. This is the entrance of the laser. This you will recognize as a rigid nasal endoscope that Dr. Huang and Dr. Nayak uh, lent us because I'll let you, I'll, I'll tell you why. This is me positioning the rigid nasal endoscope into the area where I'm working and I have a TV inside the rig where I can actually look. <clears throat> and this is already with the position. The reason I'm using the grin lens is that we were having a hard time placing the grin lens into our cochleostomy or to our hole. Once the grin lens was coming down, you were basically in the dark. So now with this lens, we have a really high resolution view as the grin lens is coming down. And so this is a, a higher magnification of the area where we work. Again, this is a 20x objective. This is a 5x objective. You can see this arm right there holding the grin lens, and you can see the rigid nasal endoscope. That right there is the opening of the bola. You can see the cochleostomy. And so again, this is the same view. We have our cochleostomy. We have the round window niche there. And this is a video, me positioning the rigid nasal endoscope that we lent from the rhinology. I fix it in place. I'm bringing, now I'm seeing this directly on the TV. That right there is our cochleostomy. And if you can see that white, that's the osteospiral lamina. And we are going to be perpendicular to the organ of Cordy. Okay? So we're seeing the organ of Cordy from the feet above. Okay? And what you're seeing here is that I'm able to move the animal in, in three dimensions according to where the grin lens is instead of moving the grin lens. And so I'm able to position that nicely. And so we injected AM143 just to make sure that it was working. We fixed it. We took out the cochlea. And then we looked at the organ of Cordy, and you can see that it was lighting up three rows of outer hair cells, not so much into the inner hair cells. And then when we tried it out in a live animal, this is a live animal who's in the rig. We injected with AM143. It got into the hair cells. And you can imagine that there are three rows of outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells. The beauty of this is that this is a live animal. This is in an in vivo dynamic view, OK? Now, it's blurry for a couple reasons. I, I think it was a long preparation, and I think cells were dying. The second one is that we're still having a lot of breathing and heart rate artifact that we're trying to compensate and trying to fix with the better head holder at this time. In terms of the other experiment where we were looking at the lateral <coughs> cochlear uh, microcirculation, this is a live animal where we've decalcified the lateral cochlear bone, and we're staring right here at the spiral ligament. And this is through a grin lens in a live animal, and you can see individual red blood cells flowing Obviously, it's fluorescein is what's going through, and what's absent are the red blood cells flowing. So we were able to identify hair cells. We were able to see the microcirculation at the lateral cochlear wall in a live animal, in a dynamic, in vivo view. Now, this is a summary of what, where we are right now. We're, we're, we're able to do a rapid chemical decalcification at the scale of timpani and the guinea pig. 
We have a whole motorized stage to move the animal in, 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 in a 3D axis in terms of a central focal point, the cochleostomy. We have multiple controls on the grin lens holder, on the motorized stage, as well as piezos in the objective. And we were able to put the grin lens with the use of the rigid nasal endoscope. And again, we were able to see hair cells yeah. with the grin lens and two photon microscopy, and we were able to see the microcirculation. So that's where we are, Dr. Jack. Is the tip of the grin lens outside the cochlear endos and you're peering through it, or have you perforated through the endos into the fluids of the scala? It's perforated through the endosium into the scala tip. So this is where we are right now. We're running more experiments right now to get more, more data on this. And I could give you more about methodology, but I want to tell you where I'm going with this research. Okay? So what, are, what I'm planning for faculty years. And I broke it down into five. It's five slides, okay? Well, a little bit over five slides. One of them is going to be a vir viral transfection of the guinea pig of the organ of cording. That's going to be the number one priority. Currently, no available guinea pig models for hearing impairment or transgenic models in guinea pigs with endogenous fluorescent markers of the inner ear exist. They're just not there, okay? The gremlins are not yet small enough to be inserted into the mouse model. So that's a problem. And so we're gonna work on that. And so in terms of the virus, looking at the literature, there's basically two viruses that have sort of work in the guinea pig. One is the adenovirus, and the other one is a, a adeno-associated virus. There's even a newer virus called recombinant <coughs> adeno-associated virus that has a pretty good uh, transfection yield. So this is a study by Wang in gene therapy in 2012, where A represents a transfection method that they use through the round window membrane where they broke the outer epithelial membrane of the TM so they could let the virus in and transfect the inner hair cells. In this case, they had a lot of transfection in the inner hair cells. This is through a cochleostomy. They basically did a blunt cochlear opening and then transfected through there, they got better. And this is B with phalloidin staining. So the priority right now, hopefully in my fellowship right now with, uh, with Tony and Dr. Blevins, is gonna try to see if we can get this viral system working so we can actually have inner ear cell types that glow in the dark, okay? Two is that if we eventually get this viral transfection system, then we're able to transfect functional sensors. And I'll talk to you about three of, of these functional sensors that we could potentially use in the inner ear. One of them is called GCAM. GCAM is a sensor for calcium Im imaging. Intracellular increases in calcium leads to hair cell death. And that was proven by a really elegant experiment uh, by a, a <coughs> Ed Rubel up, up in Seattle, where he transfected zebrafish lateral line, and the sensor incorporated into the lateral line hair cells, and what they did is basically looked at the concentration of calcium, and they noticed that the cells that had high, high, high concentration of calcium were the ones that were extruded, that died and were extruded. So if we could get this sensor into the inner ear and then put the grim lens and do different types of experiments in terms of noise-induced, blast injury, or aminoglycoside, we could potentially see what is going on in the inner ear. This has not been done in the mammal inner ear. A second sensor would be arc light. It's a voltage sensing, a, a genetically encoded fluorescent sensor that measures membrane potential. This is new, it's been there in the last two years, it's been applied to neurons. And what that does is that the, the neurons that get transfected, once they have an action potential, they endogenously produce the fluorescent and they light up and you're able to see that. If we could get this into the spiral ganglion and do different types of experiments, it would be really nice to see what the spiral ganglion is doing. We still don't know the tonic topically organization of the cochlea. Maybe this can help elucidate how it's organized tonotopically. And then the third one, which is actually two, is called JC1. 
It's a sensor for mitochondrial membrane potential. And this is off the shelf. You get it, you inject it, it gets incorporated, and you're able to see. The, the whole point of this sensor is that it tells you changes in mitochondrial membrane potential. So a normal hair cell or a normal cell will have an orange red. If it starts getting into the apoptotic cascade, it turns green. And so you're able to see that dynamic pattern of apoptosis in, in, in specific cell types. Or you could use MitoTracker, which has also been studied, but only had been studied in an ex vivo, in vitro preparations, where you, where you basically put the culture system with MitoTracker, normal cells, normal hair cells, uh, absorb, intake the MitoTracker, while the ones that are dying do not, at least not readily as the normal <coughs> ones. And then the third part that I want to focus on is, as all the experiments we're doing now, they're being conducted in guinea pigs, right? The shift would be to implement smaller green microendoscopes. When I started, there were approximately 600 microns. Now you can get them up to 100 microns diameter. So they are getting smaller. The technology is getting smaller. So it would be great to implement these green microendoscopes into a mouse cochlea. As everyone knows, the laboratory mouse is widely accepted as an instrumental model for studying human hearing impairment, right? It, it has a remarkable structural and physiologic similarity between human and the murine auditory system. Likewise, fluorescent imaging has become increasingly useful for the study of the mouse cochlea due to a couple key innovations. One is that we're developing transgenic animal mouse models for every single type of disease in humans. We are developing better viral vectors that target specific cell types of the mouse in our ear. We, and all the animals that are being developed, they have now enhanced green fluorescent proteins where the vital fluoroforms are brighter than ever. And obviously, advancement in fluorescent microscopy, like what we're talking about in terms of green lenses. So for example, I worked a lot with cell culturing, and this is a MATH1 GFP mouse. We haven't been able to even describe what the degeneration process is in all these mice. This is a thigh one CFP, where all the neurons light up. You can see Scarfa's ganglion right here. This is a spiral ganglion, organ of corti here, organ of corti here. And you can see that it's not as bright in the processes, but definitely at Scarpa's ganglion, this is where the saccule would be. If we can get a lens inside and look in a dynamic view of what is happening with the hair cells as, as well as the neurons, we can have a better understanding of what's going on in the inner ear. The fourth project is that hopefully we'll, able, we'll be able to implement a chronic preparation of time-lapse two-photon imaging using smaller grin lens in mouse transgenic models. As the system becomes smaller, we'll be able to use it in mouse models and it will open doors to hearing impairment studies that have human correlates. Like for example, the alpha technorin collagen type 9. They have this function of the tutorial membrane. Knockout mice, SLC, they have problems with the Preston electromotility. C57, the black background, have age-related hearing loss. These have been studies in different cohorts of animals at different time points. Never in any of these examples has it shown in a dynamic in vivo view. And then lastly, as green technology and the two photon systems improve and reach a favorable size for implantation, we can apply this to an awake behaving mice. And this has already been done here at Stanford with the PI who actually uh, co-developed the the green lens, uh, Dr. Schnitzer, he basically put one of these uh, green lens through a craniotomy into a live behaving mouse where they implanted glioblastoma cells. And before he did that, he was able to have a chronic preparation where he could image. And I don't know if you can see there, but it says day 31, day 39, or day 58 and day 61. So he was able to image for over two months exactly the same area in the brain. And then he used a glioblastoma 
a tumor model where he proved a lot of angiogenesis. If we could do these experiments in the inner ear, obviously he didn't have a lot of the functionality of fluids, having two, three compartments. I think this is where we're heading in the future, right here, where we can study, where we can implant a grin lens into the inner ear and study normal processes followed by a pathology. So these are kind of like the five main aspects that I'll be concentrating in the in the first few years as, as faculty, wherever I end up. And I think that <clears throat> it's, sorry, I think it's still amazing that we cannot understand the cochlea, even just the basic tonotopic organization of the cochlea. Hopefully this will enable us to elucidate a lot. So anyway, in terms of the impact, the development of this technology has the potential to revolutionize inner ear research at the basic, translational, and even clinical trial level. Fundamental questions as to how the cochlear works will now be addressable. No longer will function need to be inferred from immature explants of cochlear tissue harvested from multiple cohorts of animals. Underlying pathologies associated with noise-induced, age-related hearing loss can now be directly investigated asking their potential treatment paradigms at the clinical level in trial. These are the people that I want to thank for everything that, that I've done. I want to start with Tony. He's been instrumental in teaching me all the optics and letting me use his rig for a year and a half of fellowship. I, I think his, his optical expertise is unparalleled and his straight thinking putting me clear in, in the pathway of where I need to go. And so I really thank Tony for a lot of his advice. I want to thank Dr. Blevins as well, because he actually brought me into this project. He'd done a lot of the grin lens before, and I appreciate all the advice, surgical advice that he gives me as well in, in the animals. I want to thank Dr. Jackler, because I kind of skip at times clinic and OR to go back to the lab. And more recently, Jenna Leono, who everyone here knows, really worked her, her butt off at, in the research rotation and did a side project, but also helped me through this project. And I want to thank Jim for that. I also want to thank Stefan Heller. He has been the key person who introduced me to all the research back in Boston, which made me fall in love with the inner ear. And I can tell you that all my stem cell biology research that I did with him is going to pay back as we get this optical imaging technique we can start to see the degeneration process of the organ of corti and hopefully the regeneration process to a normal organ of corti. And that's it, and I'll take some questions if anyone has some.